I think we'll start with a quiz question. I'm going to give you a quotation which is from either the Old Testament or the New Testament or William Shakespeare. And we'll take a vote on which you think it is. And that's the question. Here's the quotation. If they do these things when the wood is green, what will they do when it is dry? Those who said New Testament, you get the mark. But now you have to tell me where it is in the New Testament, <laughs> if you can. Well, actually, I'll tell you, it's in Luke's Gospel, and it's what Jesus said as he carried his cross up through the streets of Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? And the reason we don't know it is because it's in Luke's Gospel. And Luke is the least known Gospel of all. Funnily enough, that's why I'm glad we're going through it. We all know the parable of the Good Samaritan and the prodigal son and one or two other bits of Luke. But the rest we don't know. So that's one reason why we're going through it. Now we finished last time with Jesus going up into the hills behind Capernaum and spending time with his father to ask, what should I be doing next? And his father told him to stop healing people. He said, that's not primarily why I sent you. It'll make you popular. And of course, there were crowds filling the street in Capernaum, waiting to be healed. And Jesus could have been very successful if he'd given himself to a healing mission. But his father said, no, I sent you to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. So get on with that. Now, healing people is part of that, but it's not the primary thing. And we did finish last week by telling you, I promise that I will tell you a bit about what the good news of the kingdom of God is. Because to many people, it's not good news at all. In fact, it leaves them quite cold and unaffected. What's the good news about the kingdom of God? which Jesus was sent to preach. Well, I need to tell you first that you've got to understand what a kingdom is because most of us have never lived in a kingdom. I know this is the United Kingdom, but I have news for you. It's not united and it's not a kingdom. Otherwise, it's a very good title. But... Um, we're learning that Scotland wants to get off and Northern Ireland's in a bit of a mess. So it's not a united kingdom and it hasn't been a kingdom for centuries. I was watching the program on TV the last week of the life of Charles I and Oliver Cromwell. And that was just part of the story of how we've gradually taken away the power of our royal family over the centuries. And the queen reigns, but she doesn't rule. And I have never had to consider her in any decision I've had to make. Though when I was in the Royal Air Force, I had to sign the secret sacket and I had to swear to be loyal to the Queen, but it never entered my head again. What then is the point of having a Queen? The point is the power she keeps from other people. And that's the main value of our monarchy. But she doesn't rule, she reigns. And it was a French Prime Minister who said this, France is a monarchy 
masquerading as a republic and Britain is a republic masquerading as a monarchy and that's quite a profound remark when you think it through we don't want to live in a kingdom we want to be free to be our own kings our own queens and run our lives as we want to we'd be very resentful if the queens started being a ruler as well as a reigner we wouldn't like it and we'd probably emigrate there are very few what are called absolute monarchies left in our world 24 crowned heads have disappeared from Europe since World War I 24 have gone and those that remain are what we call constitutional monarchs which means they don't have power over us now a kingdom first of all has a king that's what makes it a kingdom and secondly it has voluntary subjects a good king will live for his subjects a bad king will live for himself for his own power wealth or status and when you study the history books there have been far more bad kings than good kings and that's why we don't like the idea power goes to their heads and I've news for you I've found the perfect king and his name is Jesus and my job is to go around nations telling them that they're not republics their kingdom and I've come in the name of their king not a very popular message in Muslim countries but I've risked that even in those places so a kingdom is made up of a sovereign king who rules and subjects who obey that rule and a true kingdom has no elections no political parties the king rules and that's it and there are very few kingdoms left Saudi Arabia is one of them Swaziland is another if ever you go to Swaziland you're going to a kingdom with an absolute monarch and they have no elections no votes no debating chamber there is a king of Swaziland and he rules and the people of Swaziland obey him that's a kingdom now when the kingdom of God is talked about it means he is a king and he's looking for subjects to be his kingdom because he doesn't have many and indeed as I told you last time whether you believe it or not this world is not ruled by God Satan is called the God of this world the ruler of this world and even the prince of this world and the, the mess we're in and never seem to get out of with wars after wars after wars with bad health after bad health after bad health is due to the fact that the king of the world of human beings is the devil and he has rebelled against the king of the universe who is God when the Jews have a meal and thank God for the meal they always say king of the universe thank you and they're stating the truth God is king of the universe but he is not king of the world that we live in and we know Satan is the king of this world by God's permission 
when the human race said to God, we don't want you telling us anything, we don't want you deciding what's right and wrong, we'll decide for ourselves. It didn't mean that we had total freedom because God allowed Satan to step into the vacuum and whether we like it or not, we were born into the kingdom of Satan. And that explains why the world is in the mess it's in. Now there are two sorts of subjects in a kingdom, the voluntary ones and the forced ones. And the one thing God will not do is force anyone to be his subject. We are entirely free to rebel against him as king. But the penalty is that he allows another king to be our king. And that's the explanation the Bible gives of the world that we live in. And I agree with that explanation. And if you are a Christian you should agree with it. If you follow Jesus, that's his outlook on the whole situation. And the good news of the kingdom of God is this. God is going to take back into his own rule the world in which we live and has sent his own son who is the only subject he had, the only one who obeyed his father from beginning to end and who dealt with Satan right from the beginning of his ministry. He only sets people free from disease because disease is part of Satan's kingdom and he has come to demonstrate the superiority of the kingdom of God and that's why he cast out demons they are fallen angels who possess people and do terrible things through them. But he delivers us from all these things because they belong to Satan's kingdom. But we are voluntary subjects. None of us was forced to be a subject of the king of heaven. That was our entirely free will. Well, now that's the background to the good news of the kingdom of God. One day, the kingdom of God will be established worldwide. Meanwhile, Jesus and those who trust him are anticipating that kingdom, are enjoying the benefits of it, and are getting ready for the day when it will all become the kingdom of God. And God will rule voluntary subjects. So in between, it's my job and yours if you're a Christian to get as many people ready for the kingdom that is coming and to pray daily, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so that gives you the whole picture of the Bible. The good news of the kingdom of God is you can enter it now and you can benefit from it now. And when you do, you're simply getting ready for the future when those who are prepared for it will enjoy the kingdom worldwide and those who are not will not even be allowed in. And it's that future dimension that makes the kingdom of God good news. We've got the chance now to live under the rule of God and one day the whole world will be under that rule. Or to put it in Bible language, Jesus must reign until all his enemies are beneath his feet. And the last enemy he will destroy is death itself, which at the moment 
controls every one of us. I don't know who's going to be next in this room, but one of us will be. And death has the last word on everybody. However good they are, however great they may be, death lays its icy hand on kings. Scepter and crown must tumble down and in the dust be equal made with crooked scythe and spade. The poets have seen this long ago. And so we're all under a kingdom of death. That will be the last enemy to be destroyed. And that's good news. It's going to be destroyed. Death, disease, demonic power, all that is going to go. And all sadness will go with it. All mourning, all pain, all poverty. It's all due to go. And that's the good news of the kingdom of God. I won't say any more at this stage, but if you want to look more, you need a little book of mine called Kingdoms in Conflict. And that will tell you the whole story. Now we come to the reading and the passage for today from Luke chapter 5. Now I must admit I've done a rather cheeky thing. Here's the paper outline and you may notice that I've rearranged the chapter a little for purposes of explaining it this afternoon. There are four sections in chapter 5 and I've put the two that are concerned with healing together and the two that are concerned with the first followers of Christ together. So I'm going to read the chapter in a funny order. I'll read the two healings in the middle first and then we'll go backwards and read the call of Simon and the call of Levi or Levi. So let me read the chapter in that order. When Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law 
began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them and took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we've seen remarkable things today. Now I'm going back to the beginning of the chapter to talk about the calling of the first disciples. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the lake of Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets for a catch. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And now to verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Well now, just reading that is enough, but let's just go through them quickly. I've labeled this chapter, 
worst diseases and first disciples. And Luke gives us chronic conditions, two hopeless situations, two men who are so sick that no human being can cure them. The first was a leper, and to be a leper in those days was to be unclean. They literally had to walk through the street shouting, unclean, unclean, so that people could step out of the way. Highly infectious. They were shut off from their families and friends. If they had any friends, they would be other lepers. It's a horrible condition and a very serious one. And until comparatively recently, very difficult to cure. Now, thank God there are medicines and surgeons who can do something about it. But not then. It could have been a variety of skin disease because the word leprosy in those days covered many things. But it was a deadly effect to be shut off from your family, from your friends, from society and to have to shout unclean, unclean wherever you walked. And he came to Jesus and said, if you're willing, you can cleanse me. That's an amazing thing to say. If you will, you can. Already he has faith. And he said, it's all your will that's important. Because if you will, I can be clean and go back to my family. And Jesus said, I'm willing. Of course he was. And when Jesus saw a leper, he had compassion. And he touched him. Now that would make him unclean himself and mean that he would have to go through the street shouting, I'm clean, I'm clean, I've touched a leper. It's amazing to me that Jesus didn't hesitate to touch him. And with that touch he was healed. And now Jesus commanded him to be silent. Now imagine how difficult that would be if you were a leper and you were now cleansed and you were told, shut up. Don't say a word. Because you'd want to fly back to all your friends and say, I'm clean now. You can come near me now. Actually, he didn't tell anyone. He did obey the Lord there. But word spread. Because people who'd known him as a leper now saw him back in society. And they did all the talking and the crowds came from everywhere. You see, leprosy was a chronic condition which no doctor could cure. And now Jesus has cleansed him. But the other command he gave is, go and show yourself to the priest. There is provision in the Mosaic Old Testament for someone who could possibly be cured. To go to the priest, offer a sacrifice, and give thanks to God for it. And the leper did obey him in this. Now, whenever we had someone healed, we always told them, go and show yourself to the, to the doctor. I was telling you last week about Bunty, that housewife in our church who had been nine years in bed crippled with anemia and other things and when she was healed the doctor came to her home on a Tuesday afternoon as he always did and found her sitting up in a chair now she could have done that if the neighbors had lifted her into the chair so at first he didn't notice and when she said, would you like a cup of tea? 
she got up to go to the cooker, put the kettle on. And he couldn't believe it. He said, what's happened to you? And she simply said, the Lord has healed me. And so the doctor wrote in his notes, he put a line right across her file and just wrote, the Lord has healed her. And when she told the specialist who had tried to help her all the way through, he had a nervous breakdown and he couldn't cope. He was so sure his diagnosis had been correct and that she was incurable. And he couldn't believe it. And he had this huge nervous breakdown. The BBC rang me up and said, we're hearing certain things about a lady in your church. Can we come and interview her? And we were very sensitive about this. We didn't want Bunty to become an exhibition. But we agreed to it, provided I sat in on the interview. And the BBC reporter came down with his recording machine and he interviewed her. And at the end, the BBC reporter just sat there and said, well, well, well. And I said, what's the matter? He said, I've heard of these things happening, but I've never come across anybody to whom it happened. Well, he took the recording back to the BBC and we heard nothing more. And so after a few months, I rang the BBC and I said, we did give you permission to record this story and what are you doing with it? And they said that we're not using it. And I said, why not? And they said, because they don't believe it. And the religious department of the BBC could not believe what had happened to dear Bunty. The next Sunday she ran to church and she hadn't walked for years and she ran all the way to church refusing to uh, lift in a car because she said I want to run and she had to learn to use decimal coinage all sorts of things and then six months later as she came into church, she said, the Lord has completed the cure. I said, what do you mean? And she said, he's changed my blood. And I've been accepted as a blood donor. Now think of that. Anemia was one of her main troubles. And now the Lord had changed her blood group. And she was accepted as a blood donor. If anybody had known her background, they'd never have accepted her blood. But there it was. And she's still alive and she's still well, even though it was 1975 when that happened. Now, it's good to be honest about these things. It's right to say, if you're cured, go and tell the doctor. I met a doctor in Malaysia who had had dozens of healed people referred to him to check out. And that doctor is a lovely Christian because he has examined so many people. So Jesus was right to tell him, go and show the priest. Go through that to convince them that you are healed. The other impossible situation was a man who had been paralyzed for so long that he literally lived on a mat on the floor. And he could only go places when he could persuade four of his friends to pick up a corner of the mat and carry him somewhere. But he lay on his side on that mat for years. And people would have said, like to see what Jesus can do for them. But the four friends were determined to get him to Jesus. And when they carried him to where Jesus was in a house, they couldn't get near the house. There were crowds all waiting 
to touch Jesus and get near him. And you know what they did? They went up and they made a hole in the roof. Now I used to think of tiled roofs really solid and I thought, how did they get through that? But when you go to a house in the Middle East, it's usually a flat roof. There are usually steps up the side to the flat roof and the roof will be made of rushes or twigs or even sods very easily broken through and the four friends carried the man on his mat up the steps outside onto the flat roof and then they literally dug through the roof I often wondered what did the poor man think who owned the house how much did it cost to put right that's my silly brain asking silly questions but the result was they got the paralytic to the front of the queue and right in front of Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, we're not told about the man on the mat. We're told about the people who carried him there and broke through the roof. When Jesus saw their faith, he turned to the man on the mat and said, your sins are all forgiven. Now that raises a huge question. Does this mean that all sickness is due to sin? No. There are some people who've sinned and are now sick as a result. But not all by a long way. Sickness is part of Satan's kingdom. And the most saintly people can be very sick in our world. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean you're immune from all the troubles in the world. Why did Jesus say to him, your sins are forgiven? Clearly in his case, there were sins in his past which had led to the condition. Jesus only said it once to this man and there were Pharisees there who immediately objected that's blasphemy now why is it blasphemy because if a man says your sins are forgiven he's claiming to be God I can only forgive your sins against me and if you did sin against me and offended me I hope I'd be able to forgive you but to say, I forgive you all your sins, none of which were against a person, that's claiming to be God. Because every sin is ultimately against God, and he knows them all, and only he can deal with them all. You can forgive what's been done to you, but that's as far as your forgiveness can go. How can you forgive something someone has done against someone else or against God? Only God has that right. And so the Pharisees present objected violently. This was blasphemy. And of course blasphemy deserved death under the Mosaic law as it does under the Muslim law today. As Salman Rushdie found out. And so that gave an opportunity to Jesus to talk about forgiveness. And he said, yes. Which do you think is easier to say to that man, your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk? He said, to prove to you that I have the right to forgive. And therefore he's saying, I'm God. I'm the Son of God. And you should have realized this. But he said, I'll prove to you that I can say both things to this poor man. Get up. And he got up and picked up his mat and rolled it up and walked out. No wonder the crowds were astounded to see a paralytic 
walking home with his mat. Astonishing. Now here we have two healings of chronic conditions, both of them beyond human help. Hitherto, Luke has only mentioned diseases, or Peter's mother-in-law had a fever. That's all the detail we've had so far. But now he's saying nothing is beyond Jesus' control. And these are two of the worst cases we had. And you see what Jesus could do. Now let's turn from those two cases of healing to the first followers. Simon Peter, a fisherman in Capernaum on the shores of Galilee. Now some years ago, Galilee was drying up. Wasn't getting enough water coming in. And the shores of Galilee shrank. I'll never forget seeing this. It looked awful. It's a lovely lake. And suddenly there were yards and yards of mud. But what came to light just a few years ago when Galilee went down, a rowing boat emerged from the mud. And so they excavated it and then tested the timber to find out how old it was. And to their astonishment, it was 2,000 years old and could well have been Simon's boat or Zebedee's boat that his sons looked after and they've built a huge museum a modern building on the shores of Galilee the boat museum and you can go and see this boat it's about from here to the camera over there long a rowing boat wooden rowing boat and clearly belonged to a fisherman 2,000 years ago. Quite exciting. And there are crowds who go and see the boat today. But Jesus came to Simon and said, I can use your boat. Firstly, I want you to push out into the shallows. And Peter did that, or Simon as he was known first. And Jesus sat in the boat and taught the people on the shore. It was a very good device to avoid a healing mission because they couldn't get near him. And furthermore, acoustically, speaking above water is very good. They didn't have microphones and things in those days. And to speak above water... Your voice bounces over the surface. So Jesus said, Simon, I need your boat to protect me from the people who want to touch me and to preach to them in a way that they will hear. That was the first use of Simon's boat. The second use was, I can use your nets as well. Put the boat out into the deep and cast your nets and catch some fish. Now I told you last week that I've been on Galilee with fishermen throwing their nets out. It's a great experience and those strong young men are really the sort that Jesus wanted for disciples. And so they put out and Peter said, Master, that was the limit of his faith at the moment. Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. But if you say so, we'll throw the nets a second time. And that's what they did. And they caught a huge catch of fish. Huge. 
because it was so large that the weight of it began to sink the boat. And Simon had to call to the other boat, which wasn't far away, that was owned by the sons of Zebedee and with whom they had a partnership in fishing. And James and John came out and joined them and took some of the fish into their boat and they came to the shore with the catch. That would happen again after the resurrection and they caught then 153 fish. That is an enormous catch on the shores of Galilee. If you catch a dozen at a time, you're doing well. 153. You'd be amazed how many explanations there are about 153. The most common one is that that's the Trinity squared, nine, plus the twelve disciples squared, 144. 144 plus nine, 153. You'd be amazed what explanations there are. And my explanation is quite simple. That's an awful lot of fish. And that's the meaning of 153 in my simple mind. Somebody counted them. And then Jesus says, Simon, I want you to catch men. And I've shown you this miracle to encourage you to believe that you can. But there was something Peter said, or Simon as we called him first, before that. Simon, when he saw the catch, was filled with fear. As most people are, when the supernatural gets a bit near. By the way, I could keep you here for a long time telling you about the supernatural attack on my teaching, which we've faced for years. And since I last saw you, the German translator of my teaching, a dear lady, has been plagued with screeching noises coming out of the machine she uses and she had expert after expert who could not find the source of this screech and she mentioned it to the man in Australia who is the distributor of my teaching there and he has a marvelous supernatural ministry and he said to her this is spiritual, this screeching that's holding up your work. And he said, have you got a picture on the wall? And she said, I've got three. And he said, one of those is being used by Satan to bring the screeching. And he said, tell me about the pictures. And she did. And when she described the third one, he said, that's the one. Take that away and the screeching will stop. And I heard, as I say, only this week that the screeching has gone. Now, yes, there's something spooky to people about that. It's supernatural. It shouldn't happen that way. But it did. And you know, almost with the recordings I've made about the devil, those recordings have left us in perfect condition. And by the time they've reached the people, everything I've said about the devil is either rubbed out or there's a foreign voice shouting louder than my voice and drowning the message. We've had this for years now. But I just mention these things. We're dealing with supernatural things. 
but sooner or later there's a supernatural attack to try and stop them. So Simon Peter said, Lord, I'm a sinful man. You, you mustn't have anything more to do with me. You can have my boat or my nets, but please get away from me. Extraordinary reaction. But when you're right up against the supernatural, that's the natural reaction. But the Lord said, I want you, Simon, and you're to fish for men from now on. And it says that Simon and James and John, his partners in the other boat, they all left their fishing immediately and followed Jesus. What a command Jesus had on people to say to them, follow, and they followed. There was one other, and it was Levi, or Levi, we should call him. Now, what was his job? He was a tax collector. Now, I want you to know what a tax collector did. The whole country was occupied by the Romans, and they needed money to support their armies and pay for the occupation. And so they offered to Jews, we'll give you the job of tax collector for us. And as long as you provide for us what we need, you can charge as much above that as you like. And we'll back you up. So there were more than tax collectors in terms of our tax collections. They were traitors to people and they charged as much as they could and put the balance above what the Romans wanted into their own pockets. Now when I was in Warsaw in the ghetto where the Jews lived during World War II, I discovered that the Germans did exactly the same thing. And they offered to Jews in, in Warsaw, you collect tax for us and you can charge the people as much as you can get out of them and the rest is yours. We won't pay you, but you can make a fortune out of your own people. Now you can imagine that's not the way to be popular. And tax collectors in Warsaw were hated by the Jews because they were Jews and collecting money from the Germans and lining their own pockets. A tax collector was a hated man. I think of Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector and he managed to make fourfold he was charging for the tax and a quarter went to the Romans. It's a horrible job and bred hatred. They were treasonable. They were betraying their own people. And Jesus passed by in a companion and saw a tax collector in his booth and said, I want you, follow me. And it says, Levi immediately left his booth and dropped everything and said all right I'll follow you and the first thing he did and the last thing in our study he threw his house open for a, a banquet and invited all his pals his colleagues tax collectors and invited them all in for a celebration. He said, I just want you to know what's happened to me. In other words, as soon as he followed Jesus, he wanted everybody else to. And that's still happening. Unfortunately, the Pharisees again criticized Jesus 
your eating and drinking with sinners. Now, a sinner was not a cannibal or a criminal. A sinner was someone who'd just given up on keeping all the laws of Moses. That's what a sinner was in those days. And so you're eating and drinking with people like this. So once again, Jesus was, as it were, drawing poison out of a situation into himself. When he touched the leper, he was making himself unclean. When he called Levi from his tax booth, he was making himself a traitor and coming under real criticism. Next week we'll talk about what the Pharisees were and why they were the enemies of Jesus, considering they were the most religious people in Israel. So now Jesus had two people following him, and I just want to read three verses. One, one of those days, Jesus went out into the hills to pray and spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called a zealot, and a zealot was a freedom fighter, and Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Twelve men. His father had told him that night when he was alone praying, it's time you called some others to do the job with you and train them and then you can send them out. Make them disciples first and then send them out as apostles. And so Jesus began to gather a bunch of men Possibly five of them were his own relatives, but at least three definitely were. But among the rest, he had a freedom fighter, a tax collector, and one came from the south. All of them were Galileans from the north, where they'd been for a long time. But one was from... Kerioth in the south, Judas Iscarioth or Iscariot, and he would become a traitor. Amazing how Jesus chose such a sheer mixture of people, and yet that was going to work. <laughs>